So who do you think is a good leader? When I left Jersey uh, as an 18-year-old, um, if you'd asked me then, I would have um, probably come up with this guy. Uh, Captain James T. Kirk. By the way, he's the one on the left. Um, as a tennis-playing psychologist uh, who's very keen on inspirational stories and, and science, I uh, took my inspiration from this guy. Um, for those of you who, uh, who maybe didn't watch it, or I'm looking around the room, who were probably too young to uh, fully appreciate uh, just how exciting it is to... Um, uh, to see your intergalactic hero wrestle a seven-foot uh, plastic lizard. Um, Kirk was the uh, charismatic, combative, uh, and um, charming uh, uh, captain of the Starship Enterprise in the first Star Trek series in the late 1960s. Now, um, over time, I've uh, researched and worked with hundreds of leaders, and... Um, what I found was that my choice was very similar to what most people choose. They choose a leader who, um, uh, they, they, they choose a leader who is, uh, is often quite heroic, who is able to, or perceived to, to save the universe or the world or their company single-handedly. Um, they choose someone uh, who is uh, often quite a celebrity, uh, and they choose someone who, perhaps as I found out over time and come to realize, they choose someone who, um, although in public might seem quite inspirational, in private might come across or be experienced as, um, as quite egocentric or, or arrogant. So what I found is I had to update my, uh, my choice of who, who I think is a good leader. Uh, and why did I do that? Well, um, the world has changed, the universe has changed, and therefore we need different types of leaders nowadays. Uh, recent um, uh, term that's been used, some of you might have heard of it, is that we now live in a VUCA world, uh, which is a world which is volatile, there's uncertainty, there's complexity, and there's ambiguity. Uh, our next generations of workers and leaders need uh, different things. Uh, some of the, we've heard already uh, one of the speakers talking about how the, the Generation Y is going to be needing more technology. They're into ideas like human rights and environmentalism, whereas the, the older type of world needed things like uh, career security. So who did I, who did I update my leadership um, role model to? Well, uh, I updated to this guy. <laughs> and this guy, uh, who some of you may know, uh, is the, uh, the successor to Kirk in the, both the, uh, the Star Trek franchise, uh, but also my leadership esteem. He's Jean-Luc Picard, uh, and uh, he's much more engaging leader, uh, I would contend. He, um, he's much more team-oriented, uh, and he's passionately, uh, passionately driven, but quietly passionately driven. Um, and unfortunately, I would say that in my experience of working with leaders, the characteristics that I value in Picard haven't really seeped through into mainstream society just yet. And I would contend, therefore, that the way we lead is broken, because the way we think about leadership is broken. And to use, uh, to steal a phrase from a, a top 10 TED talker, uh, Dan Pink, uh, he said, well, he said something similar. He said, there is a mismatch between how, um, uh, what we know, what science knows about leadership and what business and what the rest of society does. There is a mismatch between what we know in science about leadership and what society does. Uh, Warren Bennis, a leadership thinker in, in America, said this. He described the mismatch as a mythology. He said, our mythology refuses to catch up with us. He says... Uh, we cling to the myth of the Lone Ranger, the romantic idea that great things are usually accomplished by a larger-than-life individual working alone, despite evidence to the contrary, including the fact that Michelangelo worked with a group of 16 to paint the Sistine Chapel. We still tend to think of achievement in terms of the great man, often more the great man, uh, but more recently, or the great woman, instead of the great group. So what I want to uh, share with you today is uh, some of the things that I've learned along the way uh, about 
this mismatch and what we can do about it to become better leaders. So the first mismatch is to do with task versus relationship. So let's check this. In the last meeting that you were in, to what extent did you just crack on with the task without too much acknowledgement of who was in the room or what they would, would want to talk about or would want to contribute? In my experience with uh, observing working with boards and teams, that's what generally happens most of the time. And that's kind of okay, but the problem with it is uh, that the heroic leader in the room or the, the person with the highest status often gets their point across first. Uh, the, the, the people with, um, with most extroversion just get their point across and you create a bit of groupthink. And that can create some quite catastrophic decision making at some point. We saw this in the financial crisis. If you look at some of the boards that were involved there, uh, what was going on in those boardrooms may have been because there was a focus on the task too quickly and one ego got their way and made a bad decision. Now, this doesn't have to be like that. Uh, in some research, uh, some recent research in operating theatres, uh, what they found was that if you just uh, go round the room and each person in the operating theatre just says their name, that's all you have to do, you create a drop in the average number of complications and deaths of a whopping 35%. So if, if you were on that operating table, you'd want people to be introducing themselves, <laughs> wouldn't you? That's what you'd want. So I guess the key point here in this first mismatch is that uh, as a leader, it doesn't take much. It's, it may seem trivial. It may seem like a waste of time at the start of something, a start of a relationship or a meeting. But if you spend time up front, you can save a lot of time later on. OK, the second mismatch. Uh, and this is to do with how we view our role as a leader. Do we always view the role as a leader as an expert or as an enabler? And um, Daniel Goleman, who some of you might have come across uh, as a guru in emotional intelligence, uh, he's popular, popularized some research which looks at the two types or two styles of expert leaders. There's one type called the coercive leader. They're the ones that you're supposed to um, uh, do as I say. And then there's the pace setting type leader, the one who is, uh, who is asking you to do as I do, to follow me in doing it in the way that I do. And what he found in this research was that those two types of expert leadership, overdone, they're okay in small doses, but overdone can create some really negative outcomes. Uh, and some of those I've seen in, in, in my experience working with those leaders. Uh, and unfortunately, that's, that's often the norm. The pace setting leadership especially is often the norm in organizations, uh, large organizations across the world. <clears throat> now, um, when you look at sport as an example as well, it's not much better. So uh, those of you who follow the Premiership, the uh, Premier League in the UK, if you look at the managers that have come and gone through there, they're usually chosen because they are experts. It's tough to become a, a football manager um, if you haven't done if you haven't been a football player to a high level before. The one exception is if you're foreign. You're allowed to if you're foreign. <laughs> um, but there are some leading lights from sport, and I just want to share a couple of examples who, um, who, uh, who, who are more enabling leaders. So there's this guy, David Brelsford, who you might have come across, the performance director of uh, British Cycling and the head of Team Sky, uh, who have had some amazing success in recent years, I think to do with their leadership. This is what he says is, is his role. He says, I'm an orchestra conductor. If I think the violinist isn't quite in tune, the worst thing I can do is to grab the violin and say, this is how you do it. Play a little tune, which probably isn't any better, and, and hand it back. I'm not going to make things better. And that person is going to feel totally undermined. Uh, another example from sport is this guy on the right, uh, who's called um, Terry Dennison. He's the uh, swimming coach of, the, of this guy, Adrian Morehouse, swimmer turned uh, CEO. And the story goes that um, one day when Adrian went swimming, uh, he went to his tr a training session really early. Swimmers always go really early. Don't they? He went even earlier this one day. Uh, and he went, walked into the pool and he looked out and um, he saw someone splashing around at the far end of the pool. And as he got closer, he realized that it was his coach. It was Terry. And he realized he'd never seen Terry in all those years, taking him from a young teenager up to Olympic champion. He'd never seen him in the pool swimming. It turns out that Adrian Morehouse, the gold medalist, Olympic gold medalist, six times uh, number one in the world, had a coach who couldn't really swim. So um, 
it's a good example of what Mary Parker Follett, who is a very little known um, management thinker in 1924, way back, she said, leadership is not defined by the exercise of power, but by the capacity to increase the sense of power amongst those led. Yeah, so, so how do you do that? How, what did Terry do? Well, what he did was he got really good at asking open questions, listening to the answers, and then building on those. And that's what great leaders do. OK, the third mismatch. Uh, when you lead, to what extent do you try and find things wrong and fix them? Uh, to what extent are you a policeman? Or to what extent do you try and build on what people are, uh, are doing in terms of their strengths? To what extent do you, do you literally, uh, are you literally a cheer leader? Uh, what I've found is that um, often high performing individuals are really critical. Um, and they say, well, I need to do this. I need to do this to help my people learn. Uh, so for example, lawyers that I come across are trained to be, to be good at being critical in, in the courtroom. But when they become leaders and they're critical, it can create devastating outcomes for people's confidence. And again, it doesn't have to be like this. So, um, this guy is called John Gottman. He's a relationship researcher. What he, uh, what he did was um, he was really good at picking whether uh, couples would be successful over time. Um, but he, 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 he did it intuitively because he worked with them so often. He didn't know why that was. So he created something called a love lab, great name, uh, to, to look at what was going on and why he knew why couples were being successful or not successful. And he found that uh, couples that were highly successful in arguments, he, he watched them having arguments on this uh, uh, kind of two-way mirror, he found that they had at least a ratio of five positive verbalizations or gestures to every one negative. And that's during an argument. It's a challenge, isn't it? When they were, when they were having a nice conversation, it was up to 20 to one. So you've been warned. Uh, in business, there's some great research uh, which replicates this. Um, this is my favorite business research. It sounds a bit of a geek saying that, uh, but that's okay. Because <laughs> um, I like being evidence-based. But um, this guy, uh, Marcel Lasada, found the same thing in business teams. You need a ratio of at least three to one, positives to negatives, to create a, a flourishing team. It's a challenge, isn't it? So you hear that and you think, well, that's a bit of a challenge. But if you can find, uh, it's a real opportunity if you can find uh, authentic reasons to, to catch people doing things right because it can make a massive difference. Okay, so um, what have we learned? Where are we at? I, I, I think I would say that um, that it's um, it's important that we start focusing less on this heroic leader and more on the humble leader. Um, uh, we need leaders to articulate and embody uh, an idea so that they. Um, they can kind of compel people to follow them. But when the idea becomes too successful, the status of the, status of the idea becomes too big, and egos get too big, then we, we fall into problems. And we start following leaders who we think we like because they're charismatic, rather than we should follow because the science tells us that they create better outcomes. So um, I did some research on boards recently, and it was summed up by one phrase that somebody, somebody said in that. He said, any chairman who is described as charismatic immediately rings alarm bells for me. Charisma is very close to narcissism, so the psychological need to be the center of attention comes into play. So what we need is less heroic leadership and more humble leadership. Uh, we need people to be connecting more with their, their, their followers. We need them to be asking more open questions. We need them to be focusing on, on positives a little bit more. So um, they need to be asking thing, questions like, um, what are you passionate about? Or what did you do really well today? Uh, and if you're not already, you know, try some of those, those types of questions out and see what happens. So I came back to live in Jersey just last week after 20 years away. Um, so first of all, thank you for coming back, uh, coming to my welcome home party. It's nice to see you all. <laughs> Uh, and secondly, it's, it's great really to be able to take stock of what I've learned along the way and share a few simple things that can make us all better leaders. Um, T.S. Eliot said, we shall not cease from exploration and the end of our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. So my simple wish uh, for us all is to stop 
and explore who are our leadership role models. And then perhaps to reconsider how we can lead the next generation with a little bit more humility. Thank you.